Hey everybody, Becky here. I'm here with Noe, and we're going to talk about Bluetooth code today. Those are some sweet headphones, Noe. What's going on with them? Yeah, thank you. So I got inspired from your uh, previous project where you hacked uh, a pair of Skull Candy headphones. You put like oh, yeah. uh, some floor pixels in there. Um, so I figured I'd take that project, update a little bit with some 3D printing, and use the new Adafruit Feather Blue Fruit module. So that's nice. like the all-in-one thing. It's got the lipo charge and everything. It fits nicely in these little things. So I got the color picker code working because it's a, it's a demo sketch. It comes with uh, the library. And I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to have your brain cap sketch so that I can actually trigger some of the animations as opposed to just changing the colors. So I started working with that and I changed a, you know, a couple pins here and there, but it just wasn't working um, with those simple changes. So I was hoping that uh, we could show people and myself here uh, how, how we can adapt that sketch to work uh, with, the, with this hardware, with the, with the Feather board. Sure. Cool. Yeah. The brain cap, if you'll remember, uses a Flora and the Flora Blue Fruit module to control 74 NeoPixels all over the skull. And uh, then it's controlled with the Adafruit Blue Fruit LE Connect app in the controller mode and then the numbered buttons are switching the animation mode and the color picker also controls the color. So it's kind of a mashup of the two example codes, NeoPixel Picker and Controller. So um, do you want to open up those two sample sketches and we can take a look at them and then talk about how we might combine them together? Yeah, sure. So I, on the left here I have the NeoPixel Picker and you can see that it just includes the libraries for SPI, the UART for, for communication, the BLE, and then it includes this Bluetooth config file. So did you go through the Feather tutorial and already change your SPI reset pinned to four? That's right. OK, great. And then in the NeoPixel Picker setup here, it has the number of the pin you're connected to. Mine is six. What's yours? Mine's also six. OK, great. And the number of pixels, I'm using a NeoPixel matrix, so my number of pixels is 64. Cool. So this block here describes which method you're going to use for c connecting to the blue fruit. And on the Flora one, you'll see that it uses uh, the here hardware serial. But um, for the Feather board, we're going to use hardware SPI. So make sure that hardware SPI is uncommented and the other ones are all commented out. So this, so you got this working, right? It, oh, yeah, it works. It to your Feather. I have a NeoPix. I'm working on a project that's very similar, Noe. It is um, an update. It's kind of like the SM Messenger bag, but it's a small 8x8 matrix with a Flora and a Blue Fruit module on the back. And I was hoping to have it display uh, snowflakes. Anyway, I uh, went ahead and wired up another one that uses the, the Blue Fruit Feather so that I can um, have, a, have a sketch that you modify to work with either one. Um, because I feel like that's what a lot of people want to know the differences and how to switch between you know whatever board you might have because a lot of our sketches can work on the different boards but might require a couple tweaks in order to make that happen um, so I'm gonna now that this I have the color picker app I haven't gotten this working myself so just so we're caught up on the same troubleshooting steps I always quit out of the BLE app mm -hmm. and restart it before um, when I've restarted this so that I'm on the same page with a new fresh connection now the blue light is on on the back of this one indicating that it is connected cool. and when I send it a color uh oh did I actually upload the sketch to my feather I think I did so you got this working huh yeah oh I know I know what's wrong this has caught this has caught me up before. Um, it's set up to only work when the serial monitor is on. <laughs> That's, That's it. a funny thing, right? That it caught is. me up before, and it's catching me up again. Yeah. In the setup, uh, it says to not really continue the rest of the code unless there's a serial connection active, and so. Um, and then it says required for Flora and Micro, and I think that's because the Bluetooth module connects through hardware serial and so it's just looking to make sure it's connected um, and we want it to work on battery power when there's no serial monitor initialized nothing listening to it so I'm just gonna comment that line out uh, then I'm gonna restart again it's connected navigate to the color picker and there we go Yay. Okay. so now when I when I change like for instance the uh, the brightness we can dial down mm -hmm. and it'll be reflected I can change the the color, right? Can you see that that's pink now? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm at the same point as you are. And so now I want to make, uh, basically want to take the example, this, this NeoPixel picker example and this controller example and combine them into one, right? And so I just got both of these examples from the, the NRF51 library, controller and NeoPixel picker. Yeah. 
when we take a look at the controller sketch, we can see that it actually has color picker built into it as well, um, although it might not. Uh, it doesn't actually send it. It doesn't actually send color. it. Yeah. It just it tells you that it's reading a color and it sends it to the serial port. So you can like see that it's receiving the color, but it doesn't actually use it for anything. So that's why we're building it off of the color picker sketch that already uses it. But what we do want to add is this this section here of the buttons. Okay. So I can copy this whole section and you can just put it into your loop of your NeoPixel picker sketch. It can go before or after the color, it doesn't actually matter. Um, and then you should see when you upload that code, the buttons won't do anything yet, but on the serial monitor, you'll see the buttons uh, being pressed and released. So to fast forward just a bit, maybe we'll take a little peek at the sketch I prepared for you. Here it is, ah. <laughs> all like cooking show style. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that here I have the same buttons section but I've added one more line and it's this one that says animation state equals the button number. So I've initialized a, an extra integer variable um, up top, but you don't actually have to do this. You could just have, uh, you could use the button number variable to evaluate, but since I um, am only an intermediate level coder, it really helps me to have variable names that really describe what the number actually is so that when I'm evaluating against it, I can make sense of like what's happening. So um, that's why I coded this to say if animation state equals one, and that's like if I'm pressing the first button, then I get that animation state. So that helps me understand it, but you could just as easily switch that out for this button number. And then, um, so you can see I've added this section. And what this section does, it's, it's inside the packet buffer B so this is all one little one if statement that says if the if the packet it contains a button press from the controller interface, then check and see if the button is one. And if the button is one, then execute this function, which is flash random, which you might rec recognize from like the Sparkle Skirt or other things that use it. The tiara um, is just a function that flashes a random colors and. Uh, random spots of NeoPixels. And then if animation state is two, uh, we all recognize the color wipe from the NeoPixel sample library. And then if animation state is three, then do this Larson scanner animation. And if it's four, uh, put another color wipe in there since um, it's just familiar. And the brain cap mm -hmm. uses a slightly different addressing system where I've made like arrays of these individual pixel numbers so that I could more easily write animations just for that, but that's not applicable here, so I removed those functions. Cool. Okay, so in addition to adding this button state, animation state evaluation block, I, the only other thing that's added in here are the animation functions at the bottom here. So we have color wipe, we have Larson scanner, and we can write as many as we want. Um, and then up top, I added a couple of uh, global variables to support those. That would be like I initialized the color. Um, the external functions don't compile unless you set the color to something to begin with. And then when color picker kicks in, it'll overwrite that color, but it's good to set it as a default if you're using um, external animation functions. And then um, here I initialize that animation state variable. And then um, these two variables are for the Larson scanner. Then I'll just make sure that it's the board selected is the Adafruit Feather 32.4. It's on the right port. Obviously, it, it compiles, and I'm going to program it up. Oh, there was one other thing I added. So the first thing it does is do a wipe of the default color, and that lets me know, uh, especially for something like the brain cap that could be damaged in transit, oh, yeah. lets me know that all the pixels work and uh, that it's on. And so now that I've uploaded this new sketch, I'm going to go ahead and force quit all my apps again on my Android, and then uh, connect to the Blue Fruit LE, choose the control pad, and then select one of the controller buttons. So that was the random flash. And then this one should be the color wipe. wipe. <laughs> I, some of the, one of the things that comes up with these animation modes is that like, not all of them, uh, not all of the functions you might write will clear the the NeoPixels before the function is over. Ah. So you'll notice that if I do the color wipe, it'll wipe them all on, but it doesn't wipe them all off. And then random, <laughs> the random function doesn't wipe them all off before it starts flashing random. So that's why you're getting this funny overlap. So that's definitely one thing that you'll have to watch out for, okay. is to like clear all the NeoPixels when it switches uh, between functions. And I, I have that wired to, so like my, uh, 
my animation mode for what? Oops, oops, volume. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's something you'll have to. That'll like depend on what animations you want to use, you know. Sure. But in general, um, that's what's going on here. So this sketch is working. Do you think this sketch will work for you? Yeah, I think so. The only thing I want to add is, of course, the Rainbow Cycle, because that's my favorite one. Oh, Rainbow Cycle is a good one. Yeah. Those both use the wheel function, though, right? OK, so I'm just going to grab like all the rest of these functions from the strand test, and I'm just going to add them down below. It can't hurt to add those extra functions in. If you don't call them, then they don't. Uh, right, yeah. You might want them later, switch them out. Yeah. So the only problem with these functions is that they all they all say strip dot set pixel color instead of pixel dot. Could you set do pixel a, color. a replace all maybe? Yeah, I think that's what I want to do. So I'm just gonna select just those. I'm gonna do a find. I'm gonna say strip dot set pixel color, and I'm gonna replace it with pixel dot set pixel color. And so you can name the strip whatever you want. And it's just unfortunate that these two examples don't use the same naming mm -hmm. convention. And I'm just going to go, uh, actually, I want to replace anything called strip, not just set pixel color, because there's also strip dot color. So how about just strip dot with pixel dot? Does that work? Great. Uh, let's just double check that it compiles. When you do a find and replace, it can be kind of tricky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does compile. OK, so do you want to now we want to test it? Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to reprogram it so you'll see that the feather serial lights are going to flash. It's going to do my quick little color wipe to show me that it has reset the power. I'm going to restart my app again. Okay, so what what um Oh, did we actually call this function though? I don't think we did yet. No. Oh, okay. That's a thing we got to do. All right, so now we have rainbow cycle in there. Let's uh, copy it from s the calling from Strandis. We'll put it in, uh, what button number did you say, pick number four? And then I'm going to, in flash random, I'm going to clear the screen first as well. In addition to adding those animation functions from strand test into the bottom of here, we've also got to call it somewhere so it actually shows up. So uh, what did you suggest? Put it in, in number four? Yeah. OK, so here, look. There it is in number four. So when I press button number four, it should do rainbow cycle. I'm going to upload that code to the board. You'll see that the f lights on the feather will flash. I get that like strand, that color wipe that I set up to begin with. It's hard for me to fold mm -hmm. my phablet. <laughs> there you go, rainbow Rainbows. cycle. Rainbows, awesome. The thing about, uh, one more thing about these animations, though, that I noticed. Um, and specifically applies for Rainbow Cycle, is that um, it's going to not check for a new button input until that part of the animation has completed. Oh. So one thing that um, I did in the uh, these other ones, they're all kind of short functions. So color wipe obviously just goes through the, the colors. Uh, color wipe obviously animates through all the LEDs. Oh. And flash random uh, flashes a configurable duration of random LEDs. And uh, Larson scanner will go back and forth across the different LEDs. But the rainbow cycle takes a long time because it animates a rainbow gradient all the way through all of the pixels. Yeah. And so one kind of downside of using a, an animation function like that is that it, it won't be responsive to a new, like it'll, as soon as it's finished, it'll pick up on whatever the button that was pressed was, but it won't start the new animation until it's finished what it's currently up to. So something that I was playing around with was kind of like writing um, just like one section of the animation that, that repeats. So you might like rewrite the rainbow cycle function to uh, only do like part of its loop before okay. it, uh, so that it then is checking for another button press so it can be interrupted. And of course, like you could use interrupts for something like that as well, um, but that's just a caveat. So here's the brain cap sketch, and um, I, I made these arrays of pixel numbers to define like the different stripes of pixels on the hat, and that helped me like visualize the relationship, you know, so that I could animate through like just this array sequentially. Sure. And the array is of like either an increasing or decreasing, like so that to make it consistent. And then so you'll see that some of these animations down at the bottom, they refer to those arrays. 
but um, in the animation, um, it doesn't do too much stuff, right? So in this, for instance, in this flowing stripes animation, it only cycles up the for loop up to 11 before it checks for another button press, basically. And uh, that is handy. That means it does one row of stripes, and then it checks for a button. Stripes, button, stripes, button, instead of like stripes many times and <laughs> ignoring the buttons. There's a delay in the sketch, I think of like a half a second when it's looking for a new packet, and that's so that it doesn't like get overloaded. But because we're writing animations that take time to execute, I think we can safely lower that delay, which makes the frames of the animation seem more seamless. And I think that was just up here, this, um, this BLE read packet timeout, I think was set to 500, which is half a second, and I just reduced it to 30 milliseconds. And, and okay. I just know that then if I were to write a really short animation, I might have to increase this delay if I came across some like data jamming problems. But so far, it hasn't been a problem. Yeah, and now I'm going to make this snowflake wearable two ways with the flora and the flora blue fruit and then the, the feather. The feather is cool because it does both of the things that these do, but then it also has the built-in USB live poly charging. And it's only, this project then is only three solder joints. That's awesome. And if you guys have questions about uh, wearable electronics, I'll tackle them on my live show. I think if you have questions about 3D printing, Noah and Pedro will answer them on the 3D printing show. And if you have technical support questions, like you're trying to modify our code, uh, and add in extra features, you can always post up in the forums where dedicated engineers can help you out there as well with troubleshooting. I mean, we're both in there too, but there's also more people. You got it. All right, Becky, well, thank you so much for your time. Cool. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube if you like our videos, and we'll see you next time.